I'm Harry Belafonte, and I'm on an eternal quest for justice, and for justice for all those who are desperately in need of it, especially. And uh, the reason I'm down here on Occupation Wall Street is because I think there's a manifestation taking place that's uh, one of the great opportunities that have knocked at the doors of the 21st century. I think what makes the Wall Street movement important and what makes it one of the most critical moments in American movement history is the fact that in the very first instance you've adopted nonviolence as the code of behavior. That has already proven to have inordinate rewards just in the response of citizens who may be misled or maybe confused about exactly what's going on, but they certainly look to the Wall Street movement with a great sense of approval and a great sense of expectation that this may be the real deal. I think it is. Well, I think my first response to demands is that I sh would like to be able to demand of those in this movement that they not acquiesce to media. If you're looking at media to be your ally, it's a very naive thing for you to be thinking. It's not your ally. Most of the media is owned by those who, who control all the very things that oppress us, and they speak for that, and they have a loyalty to that kind of class d uh, structure and that kind of class uh, definition. Uh, and as far as the press is concerned, from the point of view of the need to capture their attention. If you do the right thing, don't worry, they'll come. Uh, they were all there in Birmingham when they shot all the things that happened to the, to, to the, to the civil rights movement. They were there from the marches down to Selma to Montgomery. They were there for Dr. King's speeches. When the movement gets, the, gets itself well-oiled and has its objectives clearly defined and it's making its mark, you'll get all the press that you need. I don't know that you should be too disturbed with the fact that they're not coming down on your side. That's the way they've always been. The New York Times is one of our most severe uh, hurdles during the time of Dr. King. They wrote editorial after editorial denouncing him and uh, distancing themselves from our movement. But in the end, they had to also walk and step when it came time to honor him as a major American holiday. I think the labor movement views what's going on with this uh, Occupy Wall Street movement is an opportunity for them to, after many decades, to get back on track, to become a part of what it was that they were when they were conceived as a representative body for workers and for people who were oppressed. The early days of the CIO, the early days of AFL, organizing throughout the South to bring blacks and whites together to bring women and men together, all those things that shaped uh, the union culture of America were remarkable objectives, and many of which were achieved. They got to a point where, like everything else, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And a few powerful men within the union who saw opportunity began to dismantle the best that was in the union and the things that unions had designed. And uh, for a long time, they were torn apart. As a consequence, everybody knows that a very small percentage of the workers of America are represented in unions. And I think the unions understand that a way in which to redeem themselves and to become part of a new paradigm, to see a grand way in which to go into the future for the 21st century, is to take advantage of what's being presented to them by the Occupation Wall Street movement. And violence does not represent a passive spirit. It represents a higher order of civilized behavior. And if you can confront the state and bring it to its knees nonviolently, it is safe to suggest that perhaps the state will never rise again. If you meet them with violence and the tools of violence are employed, then violence becomes the eternal mechanism by which all things are done. 
But where does nonviolence sit? When you look at the consequence of what it of what it does and see in it the righteous moment. A lot of people talk about the civil rights movement in varied, uh, at varied levels and various dimensions, but the truth of the matter is we never lost one battle we set out to win. Not one. We set out to destroy the laws of segregation that, that so cruelly governed us. We changed those laws. That was a huge step for us. I don't know of another thing in human history that has repeated itself as an idea, as a thought, as an application that can, re that can boast of as much success as we're seeing. Nonviolence is a hugely potent weapon. And I think the opposition would love to provoke all of us into behaving violently, because that's the only way they can win. Now, if we stay the course, including accepting death as a possibility at the end of the line, then you have exercised the most potent aspects of nonviolence. Uh, the willingness to die for what you believe in is the best measure as to the power of the tools that you're using to strike a blow for freedom. It throws the burden of oppression on the state. It throws the burden of oppression on the oppressor. And uh, Dr. King used to say, until you make the oppressor uncomfortable with the mechanisms of oppression that he uses, then you will ne forever be oppressed. And I think that what nonviolence does so brilliantly is it makes oppression inconvenient. And I love the fact that Wall Street is making a lot of things inconvenient. And what I'm hoping is that everybody has just seen the tip of the iceberg. I would say because I have seven grandchildren, and I now have two great-grandchildren. For the first time in a very long time, I can really genuinely trust what's out there. When people say, what's happened to the young? Why are they so uh, discontented? Why are they, where are their voices? Why have they not been heard from? Well, yo, you just met them. They're on the way. And for that, I kiss each and every one of you. Thank you. Watching. We are. We are. Louder. We are.